Um, we had two really great discussions, two really great presentations that I think really kind of touched on really important factors of detection engineering. So one is this juxtaposition of false positives and false negatives, um, and how you can go towards reducing false negatives while maintaining a reasonable false, like, false positive approach. And the way that they, they talked about doing that is to disconnect detection, um, detection firings with alerts and investigations, right? So the, the idea is, is that just because your detection fires or there's an event that matches your detection rule, that doesn't mean that you need to fire up the entire investigation process, and that allows you to maintain resources. Um, one of the things that is really interesting to me when I'm kind of looking into signal detection theory, which is the kind of psychological or the overarching theory behind detection, um, is, this, is this juxtaposition of false positives and false negatives, and the, the idea that different detection problems, right, so in cybersecurity we have one detection problem, but for instance, the criminal justice system is a detection problem. The question is, is did the person commit the crime, right? And, uh, and like medical testing is another detection problem, which is uh, does this person have the disease, right, for instance? And different detection problems are going to prioritize the reduction of either false positives or false negatives differently, right? And so in the criminal justice system, we have this situation to where we wanna reduce false positives, right? Because for instance, convicting an innocent person of a crime is worse than letting a, letting a guilty person free, right? Um, but in medical testing, you could say that false negatives are viewed as being worse because, uh, for instance, not detecting cancer early on, for instance, is worse than uh, telling somebody that they're fine when they're actually not. And so one of the questions that I think they kind of touched on this from their perspective, but I'll go ahead and ask everybody just to kind of get the juices flowing, you could say. Um, in detection engineering in the context of cybersecurity, do you think that false positives or false negatives are worse? And maybe give us a little explanation of why, and I'll start with Olaf. Oh, great. So, um, Tons of time to think about it. <laughs> yeah, now I have to do it on live, right? But it's, um, I, I think, I face forth, it, it, it stands to reason that false negatives are worse, because not knowing that you got breached is always worse than having noise. I think noise can be dealt with up to a certain extent. I think they had a great example where they used indicators um, on top of detections or, or in parallel to detection. So, so the stuff you know that you want to make sure that it always alerts you build a detection for. That's also how, how, how I approach it. And the other stuff is it could be bad or not, and their false positive rates are, I wouldn't tune it as much, because yeah, an attacker is smart enough that he knows how to mimic whatever is happening in your environment if they spend the time and effort to do so. So um, those indicators, um, what we built as well is a sort of framework around it where we can um, quantify every indicator uh, based on all of their entities and, and their context around it. So we look, not only is this a user in our environment, but also which, which rights do they have? Do they have a path to any sensitive resources in, in Bloodhound or all these kind of things? We look them up externally and, and based on that, con that context, we give them a rating and then we do correlation on all of those ratings over multiple time frames. Um, so their false positives don't really make a lot of sense because in correlation, they get, they get evaporated anyway. Cool, thank you. Emilio? I would, uh, I would simply simplify, I would simplify that, uh, saying there, there aren't many ways to deal with false negatives, but there are tons of ways to deal with false negatives. I, I, uh, I use the method, yes. so in that sense, yes, uh, false positives are worse than false negatives, and you're not going to detect your threat. If you have false negatives, there are ways to deal with them, so in that sense, For sure, for sure. Thank you. Remy? Yeah, um, I think it's, it depends on the, the context. Um, well, if you're, uh, uh, you have uh, limited resources, uh, maybe false positive are the worst because you want at least to treat uh, the most critical sure. things first. And if you have a way to handle the false negative, then maybe the false negative is the worst. Uh, uh, but if you don't have the, these resources, resources, 
Well, then the, I, uh, I'd say the false positive are, uh, are the worst. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think it context matters, right? I think uh, Rimi has a very good point. Um, so it depends what you are as well. Uh, I'm the only one here who works for a SIEM vendor, so my team deploys rules that goes to all of our customers. Uh, so generating a lot of false positive impact many, many lives, uh, well, analyst lives, not, not threatened lives. Um, and there's also the impact. If we make a bad rules that generate thousands of false positive per customers, uh, that generate lots of problems. So false positive are big problems. Um, false negative, if they're known, if we have uh, assumptions or if we know our blind spots, then they're less dangerous as well. So if we follow um, uh, like the ADCS framework from Palantir, that can help you uh, negate a little bit the, the false negative. But in general, yes, not the missing uh, an attack is more yeah. impactful than having a bit of a flood of uh, alerts. Awesome, awesome. Okay, actually, it looks like we've had quite a few questions come in, so thank you to mm -hmm. all of you in the audience. I'm gonna pick one. I was gonna pick them in order that they came in, but I don't think um, I don't think it's in chronological order anymore. So uh, one easy one is: does, is Yamaha an acronym, or what did that name come from? <laughs> well, um, yes, you know, um, like uh, Yast, yet another system tool, or something like that. There's a, like a trend, and I was thinking about yet another something, and I have a Yamaha base, so I had to make it a, an acronym with. <laughs> Uh, Yamaha, so it's uh, Yamaha, uh, yet another mainly aggregated hunt activity. Okay, you're going with like the <laughs> YAML, yet another, okay. <laughs> awesome, thank you for that. Um, I get, okay, I just realized that they're being upvoted, and so it's in order of uh, kind of most upvoted. So uh, again, for Remy and Emilio, what is your favorite indicator? Have uh, Are there any that are kind of like your child? Like, do you have any... Uh, Baby, baby indicator. And it, based on that reaction, I think there probably is one, at least. Um, I mean, I, I give it as an example, the, the, the indicator uh, that was our Christmas story, which uh, I don't remember the exact name, it's not on my bad father, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the indicator which triggers on uh, when a, a new domain is uh, accessed on a small number, mm -hmm. on number of machines. So this is a very, very noisy indicator. But I really like, uh, my favorite thing about Yamaha is the, the pivot concept. So you pivot from an application through uh, two indicators. And this might allow you to, uh, to pivot to something else or confirm or inspiring queries. And uh, yeah, having, having an indicator for small noises uh, that are different on each machine, but might give context in an investigation, that's, that's my favorite type of indicator, uh, which don't contribute that much Yeah, one of, one of the things that I liked about, uh, at least one of the, you said there's multiple scoring methodologies, but one of the scoring methodologies was basically um, l less frequent has a higher higher score, right? And I uh, that reminded me of uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's Black Swan uh, book. So it's a it's a book by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And the, the general idea, the, the philosophy is, is that things that are things that are going to have a major impact on you are by definition statistically rare. And the idea is, is that in general, we live in an organized and ordered uh, world, right? So everything kind of makes sense, and things that happen frequently have, to, like, almost certainly have to have very small impacts on us. Otherwise, we just live in chaos all the time. And so the idea is, is that if something happens all the time, it's by definition not bad, right? And so all the bad things that, that are possible to happen are, like, the worst things. Like, the, his example is, like, the financial crash in 2008, right? The real estate market, market crash. Um, those are going to be things that are going to be statistically rare. So that, that seems to be, if you're going to take like a starting position of how do you start to score things, it's all about, you know, least frequency of occurrence or prevalence, right? Seems like a really good, good start. Yeah, and it also limits the, uh, the, it increases the feasibility of actually analyzing it properly, right? Because yeah. it's... Yeah, so Olaf's talking about the ability to actually analyze things. So the, are you, can you expand on that a little bit? Well, yeah, yeah, if, if, the, if the domain name is anomalous, then, uh, and it comes from a small set of 
processes, it's easier for an analyst to determine, hey, this is weird, I should look into it. Whereas if you see teams connecting to Microsoft, it's 95% or, or 99.999 whatever percent, it's legitimate, uh, unless a sophisticated attacker found a way to actually yeah. piggyback off that. Yeah. Um, determining if that is actually malicious or not is way harder than the anomaly uh, that, that stands out. Yeah, so, okay, so that, now you're making me think of something different. So the, in, uh, I don't even know if it's machine learning would be the proper, proper field of study to talk about this, but there's this concept called the manifold hypothesis, which is you can analyze things in like an infinite number of different, uh, from different perspectives, basically. And so the, the idea of this, like, the le le least, the less frequent something is, the more likely it is to have a major impact. The interesting question is, is how do we know that we're looking at it along the proper, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the proper features, maybe, or like the proper vari variables of that thing to know, so like teams connecting to Microsoft, that may not be the appropriate way to be looking at that interaction. Maybe there's some other feature that maybe we just don't even know about, maybe we don't have telemetry on that's actually the thing that makes it statistically rare relative to all the others. And so that's, a, that's something that I constantly struggle with, is like, how do I know that I'm looking at the right things yeah. um, instead of just what is apparent, right? Yeah, and it is, to touch on Ian's tip there, like a, a machine learning struggle is, it's an everything struggle. When, you, when you're a backend and you look at alerts, you have to say, am I looking at the right data? Are there other data? Are they more meaningful? There's this, uh, there's this concept called the snake, snake detection hypothesis, and the idea is, is that uh, humans or primates in general have evolved uh, with snakes as their primary predator, right? And so the idea is, is that human, human vi like humans dedicate a large portion of their brain to, to visual, like their visual acuity. And so the, the question is, is why do we see better? Like dogs, for instance, don't see as well and that type of thing. Um, and the hypothesis kind of posits this idea that um, the reason is, is that snakes were our predator and snakes are relatively camouflaged. Uh, and so it's very difficult to see snakes. And so the, our ancestors, which survived in rougher times, basically, uh, they were able to see snakes and actually differentiate them from their environment. And one of the things is, is that we, we prioritize movement. So there's all these different things like, uh, for instance, you go on the street corner in a busy city and point up in the sky and then people will stand next to you and like look at where you're pointing, even if there's nothing there. And that's because there's this like kind of lizard brain thing to where we, we start to think, oh, if this person's wasting their most valuable resource on looking up in the sky, then there must be something to see. There's this, there's this question that I have of like, how do we, that's a biologically or evolved process, like our visual perception, but imagine that EDRs are our perception, right, it's in the cyber realm. So the question is, is how do we know that what EDRs are seeing is actually what we should be seeing because it's not evolved in the same way, it's artificial. Does anybody have any <laughs> thoughts on that? I'll let, I'll let them go. <laughs> Scooby, come on, buddy. <laughs> um, this is rent well, time. No, but I, I think you, yeah. So EDR in, in specific, uh, and, and like all uh, other tools, uh, you cannot blindly trust any vendor, right? There's some vendor that you might trust more, some vendors that you might trust less. Um, but I think Olaf kind of talked about it a little bit in his, in his talk. Um, but you, you built a detection for something that, that you are aware of, and at some point the EDR might catch up, and then you can retire your detection. Um, so, so that's one, of, one kind of going in, in the direction you were talking about. Uh, but yeah, I think it's very important to know your, your, um, your threat models, um, test your, your security software and make sure that they are responding to the way you're expecting them. And if they're not, you should hold your vendors accountable as well. Mm -hmm. um, they are the one who provide the detections and they are the one who can improve their product. So in general, if, 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 you're, if the tool you're using are not detecting what you're expecting, you need to go back to them. If you're building your own tool, then you, you talk to yourself and you prioritize those things. Cool. And uh, I, I will uh, bounce on the, the lizard brain uh, stuff because this is actually something uh, I love using as um, uh, so one of, the, of my other functions in the stack is uh, doing store automation. So uh, automating contextualization and showing them to uh, analytics. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things I love using is the fact that we sit on um, tiny things. Yes. So uh, I love putting colors in the contextualization or in for themselves. So for example, uh, we have a contextualization when we add um, a domain artifact. So we're going to look up our environment in uh, some stuff at Yamaha to see when was the first scene and the last scene of the, of the domain. And for how many days it was in our environment. So if the domain has been in our uh, environment for a very short time, so uh, for example, one, two, three days, I'm going to put it in big red. But for all the other domains that uh, uh, I've been using for like one, two, three years, they're going to be in white like everything else. Mm. So when you look at the data, you're going to see <coughs> this one is standing out to you, might be interesting to me. And so uh, I, I think it's actually interesting. You know, you can use this yeah. to, uh, to orient analysts into looking at the stuff that might actually be interesting. Yeah, for sure. I live in Las Vegas, so of course, uh, leveraging color to force people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do is <laughs> like right up our alley. Dave. All right, so s trying to stay on the sore topic, so maybe this is the perfect question for you, but this is another audience question that says, uh, what are some tips to enrich I existing detections with sufficient context to make the triage easier? Does anybody have like a favorite data source or maybe a little trick to try to make sure that you're giving the analyst as much information as possible or anything along those lines? Um, I can answer that. Um, one thing to be wary of when contextualizing, 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 self in your data is you cannot show too much information uh, because it's showing information comes with a mental load. Okay. And if you overload an analyst, uh, they're going to, a bit like ADHD, they're going to start to ignore some stuff. So you, you need to pick the information uh, that's actually useful to show them and still show them a way to, to have the full information, but not necessarily show it by, by default. And I think the best kind of information to, to show is uh, really, well, stuff obviously that you could see in stuff you're uh, analyzing, and stuff specific to your environment. So I give it as an example, uh, the first scene, last scene, and then the number of days a domain was seen on our environment. This is usually very interesting for analysts to consider as information. So I would say this kind of information that's really um, catered to your environment and is normal in my environment is the, the best kind of stuff to, to enrich the data. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think one of the things I, I fully agree, and I think I think one of the things I would add on top of that is is a sort of historical overview of the entities that you're analyzing. So if you're looking at a machine, a user, and a domain, I would add the machine and the user at least as a historical overview. How many alerts have triggered on that machine and that user? Because if a, if you have a larger SOC, it's quite likely that that like like Mathieu looked at alert one, you look at alert two an hour later, you're not aware of each other looking at it. And in context, in or in correlation, those two actually might not be false positives and, and lead to a bigger story. Yeah, right? clarifying relations between yes. entities is really important. Yeah. I agree. What, one question I have about how you're doing uh, the grouping. Have you considered um, the idea, so there's this idea called composability, which is how things provide like one thing will provide output that's then an input to another thing. And so imagine that you have some alert that's based on some, some behavior. And that behavior can't stand alone. It requires some sort of prerequisite to be, to be achieved. So for instance, um, curb roasting is, a, is the example that I like to use. So it's like, if I curb roast, I'm not just, first of all, you can't necessarily just curb roast. You probably need to uh, enumerate service accounts first, right? And then you and then you can run curb roasting. But then I don't just curb roast for no reason. I then intend to like log on with the user that I requested the service ticket for. And so there's this this idea that kind of what you're what you suggested in your talk is that we can potentially look for things that with a broader scope, which is somebody requested a curb roast service ticket, which potentially happens all the time, right? But now I'm waiting for other things to happen that are going to be relevant that gives me context. But uh, have you considered thinking about it from the perspective of other things that are relevant to that particular behavior as opposed to other potentially bad things? Yeah, um, yeah but, uh, we, um, sorry. 
we um, we have some indicators that are like um, super indicators. Okay. They, they are built like it's a, a correlation between indicators, and it uh, it triggers if uh, they are like uh, five of these in the same hour or okay. something like that. Yep. And then you get uh, uh, like uh, it it uh, raise an alert with all the uh, indicators that triggered, and the secondaries can see okay th this happened and in this sequence. And uh, yeah, we have things like that. Uh, it and it's pretty uh, pretty nice. We don't have uh, many. We're kind of scratching the surface on the yeah. on this concept, but it, it's a, it's a goal for us to to be able to leverage that concept that uh, something uh, A, B, C, if they happen independently, we don't care. If A then B then C happens, yeah. it's probably like something that's very bad. Yeah. So it's it's something that we're uh, it's a goal, but we're not quite there yet. So uh, Yamaha is uh, is. Is kind of new, so we're still doing R and D on that. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. There's, there's two things there. Um, so there, there's the chain rule. So things that you know should not happen in a certain um, order, yeah. or just together. Uh, but there's also you talked in your you you mentioned that I think in your talk as well. There's the entity uh, scoring. So um, today you're doing this. Maybe you have a score of two because you've done I don't know. Your request a Kerberos ticket, but tomorrow uh, you start logging to this SSL um, SQL database that you've never connected to. You start uh, maybe targeting things that you've never touched before. You go to some share points. So every time you do one of those things, the score on your entity or the danger of the the, the likelihood that what you're doing is bad increase. And yeah. I think you mentioned that in your talk, and that's yeah. also. Uh, yeah, we, we called it uh, inertia analysis. I'm not sure if it's the scientific term. Um, there must be a better term for this. But yeah, basically, uh, if if the, the entity has a kind of static score and uh, in the next week it increases the tenfold and stays like that, well, perhaps we should investigate that because something new is, hap is happening on that machine and it, tri it triggers indicators which are indicators of uh, abnormal ab activity. Yeah, I actually, for what it's worth, I liked the term inertia analysis. So, yeah, that was good. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm gonna switch to another audience question, this one for Olaf. Um, so a little bit of a switch of topics, but how do you convince management to invest resources in detection as code? Yeah. Any, What's it, it, uh, he is management, it's, so it's, it was he easy doesn't for have him. to. They pay yeah. him for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I, I never had to convince management of it because they, in most cases, management wants visibility in what the team is doing. They want to have some measure of quality control. They want to have insight in the process, and these kind of things are all there. And the quality aspect is there. The validation is there. So, in most cases. And we work for, for larger enterprises and global companies. So maybe it's a different, it's a bubble, right? So if you're in a small company, it's a harder sell. But even then, you can, uh, I mean, the, the, the guarantee of, of consistency is usually already the biggest selling point. And then if you're in a, in a company that is uh, susceptible to audit and these kind of things, then it's even easier because the full audit trail is there. Every auditor likes it. Um, especially if you explain how it works, because they usually don't get it directly. But it's, uh, I think that those are the easiest selling points. It's is, is like the measurability, the quality, the insight, and, and having a consistency method there. I, uh, we're, uh, we're implementing uh, uh, detection as code uh, in our organization as we speak, and uh, management was uh, very, very open to, uh, to the idea. But if they weren't, I would have uh, given the, uh, the argument that um, we can have dashboards and automated KPIs yeah. of detections. <laughs> dashboards? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, they have pie charts. Everybody's happy. Then. <laughs> this man speaks management right here. <laughs> um, we, we have about five more minutes. So there's, there's a couple questions um, that I'm going to do a shameless plug for my, for my workshop. So uh, let's see. How do you evaluate that you have a good or bad detection coverage? I have a three-hour explanation on that uh, coming at, at 1 p.m. if you're interested in that, at least my, my perspective. Um, what does the validation process look like for writing a new detection? Also, that, that would be included in the workshop if, if you're so interested. Um, let's see. Maybe, maybe a final question that 
I'm sure everybody kind of has an opinion on, and this is definitely an unsolved problem in my opinion, is... 42. You, huh? I have an opinion. It's 42. 42? <laughs> okay, well, we'll see how that, we'll see how that yeah. ages in a second. Um, so it's directed at Olaf, but I think everybody has an opinion. How do you prioritize your detection logic from the backlog to the planned state? So, like, you have this, this backlog of detections. How do you prioritize? And how, like, so we have limited, just like we have limited uh, capacity for dealing with alerts, we have limited capacity for detection engineering, and there's way more things that we could be building detections for than we have time, so how do we choose which things? Yeah, I'll, tr I'll try to give the answer as a, as a person working for one organization, because as a consultant, it's kind of different, I guess. But um, I, I would, knowing you have a threat model or are aware of what, um, is trying to attack you, uh, I, I would have a feasibility of how, how likely is it that I get attacked by it, it's not mitigated by anything, and I can detect this in a meaningful way that our analysts can analyze. I think those three things, based on knowing your, your threat landscape, um, because running after the newest Twitter uh, zero day is not maybe the most important in every case. This is another... Nicholas or Nassim Nicholas Taleb idea called the Lindy Principle, which is this idea that things that have existed for a long period of time, you should assume that they will continue to exist for at least the same amount. So, like, if I wrote a book today, the chances that 2,000 years from now it would still be published is, like, zero. But it, the Bible, for instance, was published or written 2,000 years ago, and it's reasonable to expect that it will continue to be published 2,000 years from now. So that's kind of the thing of the longer something's been around, the longer it will continue to be around, and that's, that's the anecdote and antidote to uh, chasing the new hotness. So everybody, something new comes out, I don't even remember what the, the snake, turla, malware thing, it's like, if you, people are focused on that because it's this new thing, but if you actually look at it, a lot of it is really old stuff that's just being repurposed or wrapped up into something that appears to be sexy, right? And so if you would have focused on the old things, the things that have been around and have been successful for attackers for a long time, you would have been already prepared for that type of situation. What I'm hearing about your theory is that if my backlog is 100 tickets, in the future it's gonna <laughs> be 100 <laughs> tickets. <laughs> Perfect, they will never leave. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's difficult to prioritize well, but knowing your own environment and your own threats, you can make the best determination based on that knowledge, I think. There's no single source answer there. Yeah, um, I would say make sure you have the logs. So which, which logs do yeah. I have to actually detect this? If I don't have the logs, that's probably not my priority. My priority is probably to go get those logs, but it's my, my, if you're a large enough organization, that might be another team than the detection engineering. Uh, what's the severity of this attack? What, what's the impact? And what's the likelihood of being uh, hit? So a little bit like the vulnerability system, but you can apply that uh, calculation for your detection as well. Um, and, and what's the likelihood or the fidelity you're expecting out of it? Do you expect it to generate very little false positive or be very noisy? Is this like a one-for-one one rule? Is it more like a chain rule? Is it something that... Um, that you built more like as an indicator, that that's more like for Threat Hunter. So those are all things that you can consider to help you organize your backlog and put the mo yeah, most value on top, obviously, and then uh, for, for what gives you a one for one, you put at the top, what's more uh, Threat Hunting, I'll put lower uh, in the priority. And a, a whole class could be given as to what is a high value uh, <laughs> detection. <laughs> Yeah. So, True. very hard to answer. Yeah, for sure. I, the one thing that I was, um, I'm interested that nobody, nobody mentioned it, but it's like prevalence seems to be a thing that a lot of people will, will use, but I'm uh, cautiously optimistic about prevalence numbers just because, uh, as everybody's seen the plane with the red circles on it and that people talk about observation bias, right? So the idea that, like, if you see something, you're going to look for it, and then when you look for it, you're going to continue to see it. If you've ever... Like, um, if you've ever heard of something and then gone out into the world and then you see that thing over and over and over, but you feel like you've never seen it before, that's, that's essentially observation bias. And these prevalence numbers, well, they are useful, right? Because absolute, absolute occurrence is interesting. Um, you gotta be very careful when you're starting to compare things because just because something has been seen more often doesn't mean that it actually occurs more often. Uh, in reality or has a bigger impact. So prevalence is an input, but it shouldn't be the, the in my opinion, the primary factor when you're uh, prioritizing.
Um, also, something that has not been said, uh, maybe the, um, how, much, um, how much of a pain is it to uh, the trade actor if we block this uh, mm. technique? So if you just disrupt the skill chain because uh, you block this particular spot, um, that could be something nice to, uh, to put priority on. Yeah. So centralization, like how central is that technique or that behavior to the most number of possible attack paths or something like that would be really interesting. And so it's like, and then also how many different options do they have? So if you're talking about like Lull bins, for instance, right? There's a trillion lull bins, and so if you block one, I'm I'm just going to use a different. But uh, if you're talking about lateral movement, for instance, there's a relatively finite number of lateral movement options, and so if I could block WMI lateral movement, now you're stuck with, you know, services or scheduled tasks, or there's very few. But you kind of start to close people in. I think I think we're near the end, but it looked like you were getting ready to say something. No, uh, well, they they said pretty much what I wanted to say. Okay, cool. All right, well. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to Olaf, Emilio, Remy, and Scooby. Yep. Great, great presentations to all three of you. And uh, yeah, looking forward to rewatching those and kind of playing around, especially with your tool, because that seems like it's fun. And it really seems like a capability that a lot of organizations would benefit from. So yep. cool. thanks, everybody. Thank you.